Welcome to episode 14 of the David Bernard Podcast. Today's episode is pretty special for me. My guest is Brian Norcross, and uh, Brian is not only my friend, but he's been a colleague and really one of my best mentors that I've had as a meteorologist uh, now going back decades, I can say. I guess it's been, uh, I don't know, 20-something years since I met him. I met him in 1995. I'm always terrible at at fast <laughs> math, but it's, I guess that's like almost 27 years uh, to the day. Kind of hard to believe. Uh, but, you know, Brian is a true broadcaster. And as we'll learn, he knows about all aspects of the TV business and certainly a lot uh, when it comes to meteorology and hurricanes. He's currently the hurricane specialist at WPLG Local 10, the ABC affiliate in Miami, Florida. But uh, that's just one small chapter in what has been a lengthy and very successful career spanning uh, a number of national networks and local TV markets, but primarily his career has been focused uh, in Miami. Uh, for those of you in Southeast Louisiana and Mississippi, you may recognize Brian's name, I think, uh, for three reasons. The first one is he was the voice, the only voice uh, that was remaining on the air during Hurricane Andrew in 1992. And for hours, talking people through this calamity, these 200 mile per hour winds that were literally tearing people's uh, homes apart. And as a result, he gained uh, a lot of national recognition for that. He was also the hurricane specialist on CBS News for eight years, uh, and I was fortunate to take over that position from him uh, after he left CBS. And then after that, he was on the Weather Channel for eight years, where a lot of people probably saw him, and uh, he led their hurricane coverage there uh, during some very active seasons. Uh, personally, uh, Brian and I went through Katrina, Rita, and Wilma together in Miami, all in my first two months in Miami of course, that was in uh, 2005. We're going to talk about our uh, Katrina experience uh, broadcasting the Louisiana-Mississippi landfall and how we covered it in Miami in just a bit. I really think Brian Zach is one of the true leaders in our industry. Uh, he, he's always thinking. He always has new ideas or, or per perspectives on a particular issue. And uh, I think we're going to learn something new today, uh, probably a bunch of things. Uh, today is July 30th. 2021, and we are ending July on a very quiet note in the tropics. Uh, this after the rather historic formation of Hurricane Elsa uh, at the beginning of the month. Zach, what's been going on or not been going on? Well, exactly. Nothing's been going on. That's the good news. Ever since Elsa dissipated at the beginning of the month, it's just been dead quiet. I mean, we haven't really been tracking any type of tropical waves, strong waves out there. And you have to remind yourself, this isn't 2020. And that's the reason why everybody's like, oh, what's wrong with hurricane season? 2020 was just one of those hyperactive seasons where we never got a break. This is a normal type of season. Now, I know the forecasts say, hey, it's going to be above normal, which it most likely will in the end. Uh, but there's a period of time when we get to July. Uh, usually you get those one or two storms in June. That's almost typical now in a normal year. July goes quiet, even into early August goes quiet. And then uh, things turn around. We've had this negative MJO. We've had a lot of dry, dusty air. But there are signs that it's going to turn around. And Dr. Gray does his little bell ringing once we get to the end of August. And uh, I think that's exactly when we're going to start to see things get active out there. And just we have to be ready. You know, it's, it's everybody's always after these hyperactive seasons like 2020 and 2005, everybody's like, oh, what's wrong with this year? Nothing's wrong. It's acting like a normal year. And once we get to peak season, uh, that's when the storms come. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice, though, if uh, 2021 is like 2006 because Six. the year... The year after 2005, 2006 was... There was nothing. There was nothing. And so, uh, but we, we always have to be prepared uh, for whatever uh, is going to come our way. Uh, I'm looking at radar this morning, kind of, uh, and I, I was talking about it last night on Fox 8 News at 9 and 10, that there was this little interesting low pressure area south of Panama City. And I said, we may not get super hot on Saturday. This sort of upper low mid-level low feature could be passing by and I'm, I'm over here looking at it right now on my screen it's uh, off the mouth of the river or just east of the uh, Chandler Islands uh, what, what's that going to do it, you know it might help us in the in the end it might help us this weekend now today it's still going to be hot uh, but in general we've been dealing with this heat wave 95 plus every single day for over a week now uh, now, when we hit Saturday, it'll be a full week where we've been over 95. Well, yesterday we actually only hit 94, so 
that's a wrong statement. But anyway, we do have that um, weakness that's in the absence. It's a little surface trough, and that could activate storms a little bit earlier Saturday. So maybe the heat's not as bad as what we originally thought uh, for this weekend. Definitely not next week. Next week we're talking about a cold front. That's the, the good news. <laughs> yeah, to say the least, it is. It's it's kind of kind of bring back the pattern that we had in June when it was so rainy. Now, it's sort of good news, bad news, right? I mean, that kind of a pattern where we have this trough in the east and this weakness along the Gulf Coast, not the greatest thing to have around as you go into the peak of hurricane season. No, we want to be hot and dry. Having a high pressure on us, that keeps all the storms away. So having this weakness, this front lingering along the Gulf Coast, I don't want to sit here and say, oh, well, all the storms are going to try and come towards it. But that's the direction that they like to go towards weaknesses, hurricanes, that is. But again, it always depends on where exactly that storm forms and whatnot. But next week will be interesting. Does that front make it through? Do we get lower humidity? That'll be quite interesting to see if that works out the first week of August. All right. Well, on that note, I think it's time to uh, bring in today's guest, Brian Norcross. Brian, welcome to today's podcast. Thank you, David. Hi, Zach. Hello, Brian. Very, very excited to have you here today. Mm -hmm. Zach and I were talking about this before. I was letting everybody know uh, just how much you mean to me uh, professionally and, and also personally. Uh, it's amazing um, looking at your career. And in fact, a couple of years ago, you marked 50 years of broadcasting. That yeah. must exhaust you yeah. just, just to say that. Yeah, a couple of years ago, too. So now it's... Um... This is 53, actually. I just passed 53. So it's a, it is amazing. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how you even think about those kind of things. You know, I remember when somebody who was 30 was very old. So <laughs> do the math. <laughs> you know. So that would be Zach. How do you feel? Yeah. <laughs> you feel old, Zach? No. Uh, <laughs> well, let, let's talk about um, how that began, because uh, it, it's a great story. And of course, it's a uh, one that has some interest, a lot of interest, I think, here for people in Louisiana and Mississippi. And it goes back to the late 1960s. I guess we can start in 1968 with what you were doing. Well, 1968, I was in high school and I really liked two things in my life. One was science. I was a science and math uh, kind of guy in school and I built electronic things and stuff like that. And I also love broadcasting. I sat in my room in uh, near Melbourne, Florida on the beach there, a little town called Indy Atlantic, with my transistor radio tuning to stations. I could tell you what big, powerful AM station was on every frequency. I listened to WLS out of Chicago and WWL out of uh, New Orleans and sometimes WTIX. WTIX, New Orleans, right? <laughs> You know, and from the Roosevelt Hotel in downtown New Orleans, W-W-L. Oh, wow. Yes, I remember that very, very well. And so I so I, I listened to radio. I loved radio. So when I was in high school, I went to some local radio stations and just would kind of hang around. Back then, you could go hang around and answer the phone and kind of got ingratiated with them. And then a new radio station came on the air, uh, AM station playing Kind of uh, off-center top 40 music they called it west coast sounds it was as music was changing in the late 60s and um they let me be a disc jockey so i started in june of 1968 um, as a dj for the summer and then i went to school in tallahassee in september and worked there at the top 40 station and uh if you go on youtube and and google wtal and brian norcross you'll hear me in january of 1969 doing what I always wanted to do, which was top 40 radio with the jingles and the pace and the, you know, the this and that. And, um, and then the following year, I went back to Melbourne because they let me be a DJ for the summer again. And that was the summer of 1969, which of course was this very dynamic summer. And along came Hurricane Camille. And, and Camille was heading toward the Florida Panhandle. They had put up hurricane warnings in the Florida Panhandle. So we were interested in them in uh, the Melbourne area, all over the state of Florida. Um, and, you know, the forecast was not very good, obviously. And, um, and so that was my very first hurricane uh, advisory communications was Hurricane Camille, and that's also, as a matter of fact, uh, on uh, YouTube uh, to this day. 
in August of 1969. I know, incredibly, you have an audio recording of that. That is <laughs> yeah. very impressive. I've, I've done an okay job of, I guess, cataloging my career, but certainly uh, not to that extent. So uh, the experience with Camille, is that what pushed you to meteorology? No, no, I just thought that was an interesting thing. I always kind of liked the weather when a hurricane or a, a significant storm would come along. You know, I would be amused by it, but I was not a weather weenie when I was a kid. In fact, I think I'm the only one of the people that I know that does what we do that, that really was not. I was much more a broadcasting weenie, if anything. Um, and so, but I always was kind of interested in the weather and and uh, when I graduated from the university, actually, my first job in TV was as an engineer. And I ran videotape. There was a videotape engineer back then. And uh, I did maintenance on the equipment at the TV station in Atlanta. And during that time, we got one of those, the TV station got one of those big enterprise radars. And I would sit down mm -hmm. at, the, at the enterprise radar and and play with it and you know you had to tilt it and you know you did volume scans and all this stuff so I, and you took a grease pencil and wrote on the front of the the big display i mean that was how you kind of analyze things uh, not really knowing a whole lot about what i was doing i had taken what we called clouds 101 at uh, in undergraduate school and i don't remember what the actual name of the class was in any case that through the this was through the 70s I went from an engineer to a director, and I ended up then being a producer, and I produced the news in Denver, uh, the 10 o'clock news, and it was very successful, and they sent me to Louisville, to the ABC station then, now it's a CBS station, WLKY, to be the news director. So I was this 27-year-old news director, and that was crazy. Um, <laughs> You want me to tell the? You want me to tell the uh, the Louisville story, David? Well, I, I mean, yeah, do a convinced, a condensed version of the Louisville story because I think it is important in your career progression. Yes. Okay. Well, the story was that I had not been actually hired yet. I was in town looking for an apartment, and that night that that I got there and I had been out in the afternoon looking, there was this massive snowstorm. And I get a call from the assignment editor who I knew back from Denver, who was now in Louisville. And he said, I can't get there. You better go to the station. So somebody is there. And I go and I pound on the back door of the station. And there are two overnight engineers. This is at uh, like uh, six o'clock in the morning. And, and two overnight engineers op <laughs> open the door. And I say, uh, I'm the new news director. I'm here in town looking for an apartment. Uh, will you let me in? And they let me in the station. I went in the newsroom and all the lights were off. I'd only been in there one time in my life for when I interviewed. And all the lights were off and I found the switches and I found how to turn on stuff. And anyway, it became evident that the anchor for the morning cut-ins back then uh, wasn't there. And it was getting to be time to go on the air. And I'm looking at the TVs for the other TV stations in town and nobody is on the air, but the city is shut down. I mean, looking out from the TV station, you can see the interstate is completely covered in snow. Nobody is moving anywhere. And I'm thinking, this is not good. This is really bad. And so I ended up getting the two engineers to get the camera and aim at the desk. And I got the, the copy off the, the teletype wires and sat down at the desk and, you know, was the morning anchor in a city that I didn't know anything about and had only been in one time previously. And um, but the thing was that no other stations could get anybody in because the city was completely shut down. I just happened to be in a motel right down the street to uh, to be able to get into the station. So the newspaper the next day was WLKY shines and blah, 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 blah. And anyway, so that was my first big weather cast. Um, uh, but then the thing that got me into weather really was at that station, I had to hire a new meteorologist. I decided we needed a meteorologist. We had a terrific weather caster named Angie Humphreys. She was really super talented, but she decided to pursue a career in country music. And, and so I said, all right, cool, good for Angie, um, because I knew that was her passion. And 
Uh, I said, okay, but I'm going to hire a meteorologist to replace her, you know, because I thought the station and the market really needed a meteorologist. And there were other meteorologists on the other stations. So I looked and looked and looked, and I kept offering more and more and more money so that I was offering way more money than I was making. And I was working like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so I thought, wait a minute. You know, doing the weather on TV is the confluence of science and broadcasting. So maybe I should go do that. So anyway, I made a deal with FSU to go back. I was the first kind of broadcast meteorology student at uh, Florida State and get my master's there. And um, it was all the meteorology, but then we did communications research. Uh, I had, because I taught two classes too, and I had my students calling people in Tallahassee, asking them about what they saw on TV the previous night and the weather and what they thought about it. So that was part of my master's program was to um, analyze the viewing habits of people on, in TV weather. And anyway, when that started after that, you know, I was a weather guy. Yeah. No, no, on the air and then, then I went there. <laughs> now, Brian, I thought, I think it's very interesting that you noted that you're not one of the like, okay, most meteorologists, it starts when you're a young kid, you know, you're growing right. up and you want to be a meteorologist. I was one of those. And we kind of all have those defining moments. Mine was, Katrina, you know, as a teenager coming up mm -hmm. through high school, Katrina was that, okay, you're definitely, this is what you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I know, David, you have, I think it's Alicia. Yeah, that was, mm -hmm. I mean, I had the bug before then. I was tracking storms beginning in 77 mm -hmm. with Hurricane Anita was my first storm that I tracked, <laughs> Category 5 mm -hmm. in the Gulf. But yeah, the, definitely Alicia was my moment like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. But what, I mean, as far as your defining moment, maybe more so as a broadcaster at that point, I think maybe maybe Andrew, that was, I mean, I think we all know you for the Andrew, um, for what you did in Miami for Andrew. Well, Andrew changed what I was doing. I mean, I, starting in 83, I, I moved to Miami. I was still doing news consulting on the side, but I, and I started doing just the, uh, the weekends in 1983. And then when... The, my consulting gigs were over. Uh, they asked me to do this thing called neighborhood weather, which was doing the weather out and producing a weather segment out in the city, uh, which came from an idea that I had for KNBC in Los Angeles earlier in the 80s that I had given to the, my boss in Miami. Anyway, I did that through the 80s and then became a chief meteorologist at the NBC station in Miami in 1990. And so I was doing weather, but uh, I wasn't, you know, I was studying. I was also producing kind of featurey things around the weather. So I wasn't doing, you know, the hardcore stuff that that um, we do now, uh, certainly. And remember, back then you didn't have the models that you do now and you didn't have the data and you just didn't have all that stuff. Uh, so it was really a different kind of job back then. And anyway, uh, Hurricane Andrew, though, you know, made me into a hurricane person because um, Hurricane Andrew was a, a, a major, major event. It was a tremendous amount of work for all of us in the TV station. And, and, you know, it really taught me how much I didn't know about hurricanes and how much there was to learn and how much the community needed to learn and everybody needed to learn to, uh, to deal with hurricanes. All right, so but let's back up there for a minute because I I do know there is stuff to talk about with you with Andrew, a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But the first mm -hmm. thing I want to talk about, and I remember you telling me this, is that you you did study hurricanes. You didn't know a mm -hmm. thing or two, and specifically, um, this is before Andrew. You had read quite a bit about the Miami hurricane of 1926, and you yes. were. Exactly. So, so yeah. So what happened was, uh, first of all, I studied tropical meteorology with one of the legends, a guy named Noel Lasur at uh, at Florida State. He's you know he's back there in that era of these amazing meteorologists going back to the fifties. That was in, that was I graduated in nineteen eighty. But then in the eighties, doing that neighborhood weather segment, I spent a lot of time in the History Museum in downtown Miami, researching. Miami history to find interesting stories to tell. And I've realized that when you start to tell the history of Miami, you really got to talk about hurricanes, primarily the great Miami hurricane of 1926. It would be like studying the history of New Orleans without 
studying anything about hurricanes. It would be an impossible thing to do. You, you know, it would be a, a mismatch. So that's how I, I really realized that uh, I said to myself, oh, my God, if I'm ever chief meteorologist, if somebody like makes me chief meteorologist, I better know a lot about hurricanes because the hurricane history here is very deep and long, even though we're not having them now because there was this hurricane drought in the 70s and 80s. So, uh, you know, that got me kind of clued in by reading history that I needed to know more about hurricanes. And when I became chief meteorologist, uh, that became a full on effort. And then we had Andrew. It was a confluence of things. And I, I think the big thing about Andrew with you, at least, um, and how things turned out professionally, was a couple of things. One, it was your preparation before the storm. I know you took specific actions uh, to make things maybe more durable at the station. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it was a little bit of luck, right? I mean, we mm -hmm. had all the other stations in town basically became inoperable, and you guys were sort of the only voice out there. What... What kind of things were you doing before the storm? And I think some of these you did before Andrew was even a threat, right? This was like in the year or two leading up to it, uh, technology-wise, uh, at the station there. Yeah, it was two and a half years, a uh, little more than two and a half years before Andrew, uh, that we did a lot. So what happened was it all started, we sat around at a table, and it was the... Uh, news director, the, the administrative heads of the news department, uh, the marketing guy at the TV station, because I was this new chief meteorologist for uh, the NBC station. And, and they said, what, what should we do? And I said, I think we should do hurricanes. Nobody in town is doing hurricanes. There's a long history here of hurricanes. There's a lot to talk about. We can produce specials about the history of, of hurricanes in South Florida. And I think we should do hurricanes. And I think we should build a storm center. It's called Storm Center. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we threw around names and we settled on Storm Center, as it turned out. And anyway, so we did this kind of stuff. You know, we, we did that and we did things uh, like I worked with the engineers about how the backup way of getting a signal to the, the transmitter is and, and so forth. And, and so this went on and, and, and the news department ended up with a big old thick book about all their plans and backup plans and and we put in a, a backup connection to back then it was a radar in West Palm Beach. We put a backup connection into that uh, radar. Uh, but it wasn't until 1992 that it occurred to me that if there was a bad hurricane, like we were not going to be able to operate as a TV station because nobody was going to have power that we needed to be on the radio. So I went around shopping for a radio station and I found this uh, station, Y100 it was called, and I made a deal with the general manager that if we paid to put the line in, that the TV station paid to put the line to the radio station, which was in Fort Lauderdale, uh, that they would carry us if there was a bad storm. So we put in the line and I said, wait a minute, don't put it to Fort Lauderdale because that studio is sitting right on the water in Fort Lauderdale or a block from the water. Put it to the transmitter and then put another line to the studio. And this is back when we had money to, you know, kind of do what we wanted to do. And that's what we did. And it was tested one week before Andrew formed. Wow. And the engineer came to me and said, uh, OK, we did a test with Y100. Everything is good. We, we have a good signal from our studio here. And it was a dedicated line. And, and then in that uh, weekend that Andrew was approaching, their chief engineer went to their transmitter, took the two wires from the phone company, hooked it into the transmitter <laughs> because they evacuated their studio. And, and it was just WTVJ on Y100 with no control of theirs. Just, you know, they had, it was just us. Uh, through the through the storm, which turned out, of course, to be the the big defining difference. Besides the fact we got super lucky that our tower was on the Dade Broward line. It was condemned. They were building a new tower, but it stood, and we had that backup line to the radio station. So the combination now, of things that worked out. Now, with Andrew, you know, there was such an impactful storm. I mean, it was an impactful storm here in Louisiana, but for South right. Florida, mm -hmm. I mean, you being on, in this case, the radio, I mean, you you impl impacted so many people's lives and you, you really saved, you know, 
so many, you even hear from these people to this day, right? It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, uh, I wrote a book about Andrew. It's called My Hurricane Andrew's Story. It's still on, on Amazon and I still see people buy it uh, now and then for the 25th anniversary in 2017. And I did a bunch of talks, uh, mostly around South Florida, uh, about the book, about Andrew, answer questions and so forth. And people would still start crying. I mean, it was the, the biggest event in their lives because people that were huddled in their uh, bathrooms and in their closets. And, you know, I told people, the, the friends, let's get the, a mattress off the bed and get it in the closet and you and your family get under that and ride this thing out. And, you know, and they moved the mattress and they could see the sky. I mean, it was just a, a remarkable set of events that, you know, attached me to them. They, and, and it was at night. And so the only voice they heard was my voice coming out of their little radio. Uh, so, you know, it was this uh, kind of indelible mark that uh, the hurricane and, and the, what information we could provide on the radio. I remember, we just really all I had was a radar up until the time the radar died. And then we had the backup radar in West Palm that nobody else had that the weekend meteorologist, a guy named Brian Allen, sat in the weather office, had to dial that manually on the phone to, to establish the connection. Then it would time out and he would dial it back again. So we had, uh, we knew where the storm was, which is all that told us was really where the storm was, where the eye was, uh, you know, in relation to the populated area. You're still blowing Zach's mind with dialing into the radar, and he's still, yeah. he wants to know what a grease pen is, too. That's one of the questions he's going to have uh, for after the, after the podcast. So this was a traumatic event for South Florida. It was uh, a, a hurricane wind event, really an urban hurricane wind event, really unprecedented, probably, uh, certainly in modern American history at that point in time. How did you change after that as a meteorologist? Did, how did it change your philosophy as a forecaster and as a professional? Well, I realized what uh, having a position of power and leadership can do. You know, that uh, I thought before this, I wrote a lot about this in the book because, I, you know, it was really, at the time it was happening, it was just kind of matter of fact. But after the fact, I thought, well, that was pretty profound because I remember sitting around thinking, I wonder who's going to lead here? Who are we going to put on TV? I, I always assumed it would be the emergency manager or the mayor or somebody would be the one that would you know, go on TV and talk us through this. Because back then, we hadn't had any hurricanes in so long. We hadn't had any hurricanes really in modern television time. Uh, in South Florida. So I, I kind of waited around for somebody to do that and nobody was doing that and everybody had a million questions. So I thought, look, I kind of, I've really studied this. I know as much about this as anybody. I'm just going to tell people what I think they ought to do. And, you know, I had in the back of my mind, gee, I wonder if I'm going to get sued over this if I tell them to do something and that goes wrong. But, I, uh, you know, I'm just going to do it. Anyway, and so I, I, I learned about that, boy, it's really important to be right if you're going to do that, if you're going to stand up and say, OK, folks, here's what I think you ought to do now, then you need to really be informed. I mean, you know, this shouldn't be some kind of uh, guess kind of thing. So it really set me on a course to learn as much as I could about not just communications, communications importantly, but also hurricanes, the systems that the government uses. And uh, I ended up being on committees in Florida to redesign the insurance system that was a failure, by the way, and uh, the emergency management system, the emergency management system we use today was really you know, came out of, of what we did in Florida uh, at that time. So the governor appointed me to, to committees and commissions, and it was uh, it was an intense time. But but I felt like if I'm this is what I'm going to do, then, boy, I, I need to build on on the Andrew experience because I learned uh, so much that I didn't know. Yeah. Well, you know, to kind of switch gears here to more so just basic weather, I've been almost, I'm coming up on three years at Fox 8. Okay. So I've been with David for three years. He's, he's been with chief for coming up on three years. And there was one day we were forecasting and I don't remember exactly what this was, but he was like, precision is the enemy of accuracy. And I was like, <laughs> what? I was like, what did you say? And then, 
come to find out uh, that is that that is something he learned from you 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 passed down to him where where does where does that come from where did you you pick this up from well, I don't know where, I mean, I made up the, the line as far as I know, uh, but I used it first, I, I want to say it was 1996. Anyway, I was giving a talk to a bunch of emergency managers. It was some kind of a FEMA related thing, as I recall. And, and the questions that were coming at me were a whole bunch of details that I just thought that as emergency managers, they didn't need to worry about that stuff, that they were bogging themselves down with the details of the nuances of the hurricane and the meteorology and stuff like that. I said, what you need to know is you need to know if the risk of this storm hitting is over whatever your threshold is. If your threshold is a 20% chance of a hurricane, that's when our plan to go into effect. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know the whys and the wherefores and the hows and, and all that stuff. If the people you trust, the National Hurricane Center, are telling you the risk is high enough here, is, a, is at this level, and then you need to go ahead with your plan and not get bogged down in that. And so it just came to me, the idea of precision is the enemy of accuracy. Knowing all of the details doesn't, uh, in fact, usually does not get you to the right answer because your mind is clouded with details. What you want to know is, uh, you know, what's the bottom line? You get, you need to be sure that the bottom line of, do I need to prepare? You know, do I need to fully prepare? What steps do I need to take? That all of that is as the top level uh, of information that that you're communicating. And so, right? yeah, and I mean, so it's kind of two tiered. It's like what you're saying, how emergency managers might apply this philosophy or even us as meteorologists. But also, like I tell my team, I apply to how we're forecasting and how we give that message to our viewers. But, you know, it's getting harder and harder to do that. And mm -hmm. I don't want to go down the complete rabbit hole of weather apps and that. But, you know, we've conditioned people to believe that we can tell them three days in advance that at three in the afternoon, there's a 33 percent chance of rain. Mm -hmm. and, and it's oh, yeah. so those so that philosophy and this is just like, you know, yeah, they're like they're like 180 degrees apart. That's right. I mean, on every weather app, every TV station, you can bring up seven or 10 days on the app and it'll tell you what the weather is going to be a week from now with the same uh, in the same framework, in the same format that the weather for this afternoon is right. They all look exactly the same. So you can't really blame anybody for thinking that there is certainty about the, the weather well in advance, but then hurricanes come along and we try and make people think just the opposite of about all this uncertainty. And we have a cone that gets wide and and all these sorts of things to, to uh, convey that. So it, it's, it is a uh, we have complicated the problem. I mean, back in my day, first of all, I didn't have to forecast seven days. So thank God. Um, and and I, I didn't even like to, to like to forecast past the weekend. If you recall, uh, yes. we would forecast, you know, only to Sunday because I th thought as the week went on, people cared about the weekend. So let's just forecast up to the weekend. And then unless it was a holiday weekend and then we throw in Monday to be gratuitous about it. But but um, but, you know, I didn't want to forecast things that were unforecastable. We do that all the time now uh, because we're we're forced to by expectation and format. Right. And and that does make no question hurricane communications more complicated. So well, what I try and do about it is I try and talk uh, like when I was on the Weather Channel, I would come on and immediately talk about the bottom line. Like sometimes I would say, folks, this is worse than it looked like yesterday. <laughs> you know, I would get to the point and I wouldn't always put the point at the end. Right. Uh, and I think that 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 you got to do stuff like that to get past this issue that that the weather communication system has created. Because there's so much data out there and there's so much available to us as broadcasters mm -hmm. that we that we can present as information. Right. Like sometimes it's not good to present all that information because it muddies the message. And as you said, doesn't get to the bottom line of what the threat is. So. On that note, um, let's talk about the cone, uh, as it's known through 
most of the country, uh, the National Hurricane Center cone. And uh, that has a lot to do with precision, accuracy, impacts, reality, uh, you know, what's going to happen with a storm. Uh, the Hurricane Center, NOAA, they're looking at the cone now, which has now officially been around since 96, I think, was maybe the... Uh, the well, the, uh, they, their cone, they, they used the cone first in 2002. Oh, 2002. Okay, that's right. right. But um, yeah, but the cone came from, you know, I, I used the cone first in 96. We created the cone on WFOR in, uh, in Miami, in, uh, that the kind of cone we use now in, in 1996, because that's when the weather software allowed us to fill in the, the cone. Previous to that, I created this thing, which, you know, you can see online with segments, just the segments of the cone, because all the the uh, graphics capability was at that time was to draw little lines. So we had these expanding lines that came out that and I premiered that the Wednesday before Hurricane Andrew. So Hurricane Andrew was actually the, the beginning of that kind of graphic. So we have so a couple of decades now, this traditional cone that the Hurricane Center uh, has been producing. Uh, people still don't completely understand what the cone means. And they're looking at possibly uh, there were some surveys that were put out there for some of the broadcast community and the public at large about what they think the cone should look like if they change it. Should we change what the cone means? Should we change the size of the cone? You know, there's all these various issues in redefining it. What are the positives and negatives of that and what are some of your ideas well the cone has got to be maintained we have to have the cone i think because it's just too ubiquitous now too many people uh look for it the problem that we have today is that when the phone the cone was first created uh what I mean, the way the dimensions were that I originally figured out is I went to a guy at the National Hurricane Center who was the guy behind the scenes. He'd retired. A guy named Charlie Newman was this brilliant guy. He created the first real hurricane models, and he was the tech guy at the Hurricane Center for decades. And so this we're talking now in 1991, I think I, I got together with Charlie, and he showed me ellipses, error ellipses uh, on his computers. It was, he lived in South Miami. And uh, he was at home. And, and so I took those ellipses and kind of averaged the length and the width and said, OK, that's how wide it's going to be. And just took those and made a little scale on the map. And we used grease pencils on a plastic map, by the way, to draw exactly where it would be. And then we went over to the weather computer and drew the lines the same way based on those air ellipses. So it was the same general idea that we use for the cone today. But they were big old wide things, you know, the... the in three days, Andrew could have gone from South Florida to North Carolina based on the width of those uh, lines, for example. Well, the thing was the back when the cone was wide and the cone was based on average errors of National Hurricane Center forecasts back then over the previous 10 years, now over the previous five years. Well, back then there were, the errors were large, so the cone was pretty wide. But when hurricanes get near the coast, especially if they're strong, forecasts are much better than they are when they're out in the ocean. And that cone width is based on all storms, uh, even if they're out in the ocean. So you generally had hurricanes tracking close, relatively close to the center of the cone. I mean, plus or minus. And so generally, most of the bad weather stayed in the cone back then. So it really had meaning, am I in the cone or am I not in the cone, it had a bigger meaning back then than now. So now that the tracks are so much better, the cone is so narrow, almost every storm, the bad weather is outside the cone. So that has warped that meaning. So I hope that they come up with a plan that the cone is not just about tracking the center, that it is also about where some measure of the worst weather is going to be so that it's essentially a wider cone uh, and takes into account some kind of uh, uncertainty. And, and there's a lot of work going on at the National Hurricane Center and, and other places, really good people to try and come up with a way that meets people's expectations, uh, but also adapts to modern science and modern capability. And we've used tools like wind speed probabilities and try to overlay that with the cone and, and right. basically to show, you know, that, look, the tropical storm force winds are outside this cone area. That's probably the best way we have right now 
to at least Yeah, it's show. just messy. It, yeah, it's, it, a, yeah, it's a I, lot. Yeah, it's a lot, right. I mean, I do the same thing. Um, and, but it takes explanation and what's that? And it's not, you know, it's all jaggy kind of, you know, unless you draw it manually. It's anyway, uh, yeah. So I think we all kind of toss around trying to figure out how to essentially make the cone wider, right? That's what we're trying to do by by doing that. And uh, because people still to this day have the expectation, am I inside that thing, whatever it is, uh, or am I not? That's, you know, and then they want to, they want to know that. I want to talk a little bit about our time together, Brian, mm -hmm. um, because I was a few of the best years of my professional life. I can say that uh, getting to work with you um, and remarkably so. And some people out there know the story. Uh, many people don't. Uh, but uh, you, you hired me in Miami to go work with, at the CBS station there where you were at the mm -hmm. time. And I came down uh, eager to start at the end of July in 2005, uh, Hurricane mm -hmm. Dennis was my last day on the air uh, here in New Orleans uh, before moving to Miami. And uh, I land in Miami. And the next thing you know is we had Katrina, Rita, and Wilma mm -hmm. uh, hit mm -hmm. South Florida. And FYI, we did not have another storm in Miami the entire time <laughs> I was there. We had one tropical storm. We had Bonnie, which was a puff of wind right, that came blowing across. Yeah. So in my yeah. in my first two months in Miami, I had mm -hmm. all the hurricanes I was gonna have in Miami, and, and really that was enough. <laughs> but I want to talk about the Katrina morning. Uh, now, of course, we had the Katrina landfall in South Florida, which was not insignificant. Uh, by any right. means, uh, but certainly not what was to come in Southeast Louisiana. And uh, you take us back to that morning of the landfall in Southeast Louisiana and the Gulf Coast and uh, what we were doing in what we call weather control uh, in Miami. Yeah. So uh, at the time, I mean, first of all, it was it, I, we were so lucky. I was so lucky to have, you know, imagine, Zach, having my support guy be David Bernard. Right. And. Craig Setzer was also, you know, uh, in kind of in support of of this. We had just great people uh, working this thing, and we had shifts where three of us were working, right? Uh, and and I was on that morning because I also did uh, CBS Network, and I was supposed to be in New York that morning, but I said, um, no, uh, that's not going to work out. So we're going to have to do it from Miami, and I'm going to have to work around. Uh, the, the local station a little bit because they're going to want things as well, I'm sure. So this is the morning. Now we're talking about the morning of the approach to Louisiana and the Gulf Coast, right? This is the yes the morning morning of the 29th, I guess. So uh, so I'm doing CBS uh, this morning, and uh, and you and Craig was there, right? Uh, in the sitting in the back of weather control. Weather control I had built there in, in 1998, and it survives to this day. It was, it was, you know, it was worked out great. But, but I remember you were listening to WWL radio, monitoring it, and we had built weather control to where I had a, a, a kind of weather wire, like bulletins, on a monitor just to the left of where it, we'd stand there. And I went on CBS and said, uh, on the network, and said that, so far, so good in New Orleans. Uh, you know, this is in the Eastern time in the uh, seven o'clock hour. So in the you know, six o'clock hour in, in uh, New Orleans. And just, a, just before, I mean, I, I want to say 90 seconds before, 60 seconds before I was going to do the hit. And I think this was the one uh, just after eight o'clock Eastern, seven yes. o'clock Central. Um, that you said, and we're listening to WWL by streaming, and uh, that there was a levee breach in the Lower Ninth War. And, and at just that time, I look over and just then that bulletin came in on this monitor, the uh, flash flood warning, Lower Ninth Ward, Industrial Canal, so forth and so on. And, and I just kind of glanced at that and then turned back and they're tossing to me on CBS network. I mean, it was all bang, bang, bang like that. And, and at CBS that morning, because I had a fashion show, uh, was had given me 45 seconds for the weather. Uh, 
So I, uh, I, I, you know, immediately say, you know, what had happened and, and whatnot. And, you know, they wrap me up, wrap, 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 wrap. Uh, and I toss back to New York and, um, you know, immediately they're all in my ear, <laughs> like, what? Are you sure? Are you sure? What? 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 <laughs> you know, then the assignment desk uh, in New York is calling. What? Are you sure? Are you sure? And I said, yes, I'm sure that it's from the National Weather Service. It's confirmed by WWL Radio in New Orleans. And and uh, anyway, and they still only gave me 45 seconds or a minute for the rest of that show. Uh, we did updates, but they had that fashion show, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> they decided well. they needed to go on with. Yeah, obviously priorities, but uh, yeah, it was <laughs> yeah. A, it was dramatic, and of course, I've told my story. Uh, we did some other podcasts about what happened after that and uh, mm -hmm. my New Orleans experience. And we're not going to go down that road today uh, because there's so much more I want to ask you about. Mm -hmm. And and I want to actually, I, I just started thinking about this. I want to kind of pinwheel off of another 2005 storm and what happened with us last year in New Orleans. I want to talk about Wilma mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, uh, everyone in my friends in Southeast Louisiana, who I was constantly checking on after Katrina, uh, they didn't even know a hurricane hit South Florida, right? Because they right. were in such crisis or whatever. And but you know, Wilma was just a completely different hurricane uh, than Katrina. I mean, first of all, it was uh, compared to Katrina in South Florida, uh, Wilma was enormous in size. I mean, just gigantic. Yeah. Uh, and the real problem with Wilma, uh, outside of some areas in the Keys, was it was a windstorm. All right, mm -hmm. and so we had this, you know, enormous windstorm, which I believe it produced hurricane force winds from the Palm Beaches all the way to the Keys. It did. Yes, it did. It was a monstrous eastern front side eye wall. This is what did the damage. And 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 what happened? I mean, realistically. Uh, when it came across the east coast of Florida, the heavily populated areas of uh, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade, uh, it was, you know, it was a, a Category 2 storm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, some places well, maybe only Category 1 gusting Category 2. I mean, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it was a Category it. 1 in, in uh, Miami-Dade. It was a Category 2 in Broward and Palm Beach. Right. But, but there were no Category 2 winds measured off outside of Lake Okeechobee. I mean, the you know, the winds were, you know, it's given to be category two, but it wasn't like this was, you know, 110 miles per hour. And, and you know, we know that. No, we actually really think the winds were probably in the 90s uh, in in Broward and Palm Beach County. And but, the it fast, was, but it was unbelievable. <laughs> and the incredible thing about that was, is what happened with the power infrastructure? in mm -hmm. South Florida. Disaster. Yes, it knocked the power out for essentially the entire metropolitan area. And not only that, I mean, it caused a tremendous amount of damage. As a matter of fact, Wilma uh, was the third most damaging hurricanes in the history of hurricanes at that time. Uh, so, uh, you know, Katrina, Katrina obviously quickly became number one. Andrew was number two. And Wilma was number three, a category one or two hurricane. But because of the way the, the winds just raked the metropolitan area, the entire metropolitan area, this densely populated area in Southeast Florida, and they did remember that, you know, the wind, when you say category one, what you mean is at the surface, uh, you don't mean aloft. And because Wilma had come from the West Coast, so you had all this friction over the land, which lowered the surface winds, but you still had very strong winds aloft. So that caused failures at about the 20th floor in the, in the high rise buildings, um, one high rise building mainly, but in Brickell Avenue, and that ripped off uh, some uh, fascia material and so forth. And then that streamed into all these glass buildings and that created flying glass into other buildings and created a tremendous amount of damage so it was from a category one hurricane, but the winds at the level that the damage was being done were no doubt uh, something higher and the same kind of thing happened uh, in Broward County. But as you say, David, uh, it proved that you don't need a big hurricane to take out power on a large scale. And yeah, because the power, the power was out um, for 
Well, some places almost six weeks, but the average right. was two to three weeks. Fortunately, it was at the end of October and we got cool, cool air behind it. Uh, but, but Zach, I think you were talking like how this kind of compares to what else, what happened here. It's exact same thing. I mean, last year with Zeta, at the, uh, nearly to Halloween, and we get a fast moving. In this case, they've upgraded to a Category 3, but the city of New Orleans didn't experience a Category 3. It was that Category mm -hmm. 1, maybe a few gusts to Category 2, but... 90% power loss, a major metropolitan area getting a lot of wind and not that much intense wind, but strong enough winds as a category one. And you see that type of power loss. It's almost like that modern day hurricane where it didn't have the water. It was all about the wind, but it goes back to what you said earlier. It's, it's impacts. It's, it, and right. that, that's what. Well, in Southeast Florida, the power infrastructure has been improved, but Irma came along in 2017, if you recall, and remember the center of it uh, moved over the Naples area on the west coast of the state, but it was a giant storm. So the wind in uh, Miami-Dade and Broward County blew uh, just like crazy, you know, strong tropical storm forced winds. Occasionally a few spots, elevated spots had hurricane force winds right on the coast, but basically it was a strong tropical storm. And it knocked out power all over the place. And some of that power was out for weeks. And not only that, it knocked out um, AT&T, lost their Internet service uh, to all of South Florida because of flooding, of all things. Uh, so it, it really goes to show that, you know, our infrastructure, in spite of, of a lot of improvements between Wilma and 2017, there's a long, long way to go. And. Um, in Florida now, uh, they're, they're really, there's a whole program underway to spend billions of dollars to bury the power lines, which is a bit mixed, but generally good. For most hurricanes, buried power lines are better than power lines that are on poles and go through trees, right? Because it's the trees generally that bring things down. Uh, but the problem is when you bury the power lines and then you have a flood, uh, if the flooding gets into the infrastructure and ruins the infrastructure, then who knows when the power is going to come back on because you got to build it under the street again. Uh, that's a, a whole different scale of problem than putting it back on the poles. And I mean, it really shows in some ways how modern hurricanes are even more of an inconvenience than they were 40 or 50 years ago, just because of our extreme reliance on power and now Internet. Uh, and mobile phones. Power. Yes, and mobile phones. Yeah, exactly. Um, and... One, one more item I want to bring up, and, and we had talked about it the other day, and I, I've heard you say this before, and it was in your book, uh, The Hurricane Almanac, uh, another book that you wrote, and uh, that uh, people uh, can still purchase online, I believe, right? You can still get The Hurricane Almanac? Yeah, uh, maybe. You can get a used one, probably. But yeah. the thing is, that the, the latest one was written in 2006. It's The Hurricane Almanac 2007. So... Uh, in fact, I just found out that, that FIU, Florida International University in Miami is a big school. They use it as a textbook and now for years I had no idea. And I'm horrified because there's so much in there that's out of date. It's 15 and, years and, out of date, you know, 15 years well, old, that information. I, I, I went and um, I went and I went and dusted off my copy. Uh, oh my, that's the 2006 one. Oh, that's yeah, I, that's well, a little older. Well, you should have given me the 2007 one, but at any rate, uh, you didn't a make lot them pay of, for that. A lot of the, a lot of the that? principles, yeah, a lot of the principles stay the same. And and one that you talked about back then, and we talked about the other day, is is the question of insuring hurricanes. And I kind of mm -hmm. want to ask you that uh, under the auspices of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, on a climate question, um, you know. We don't have any real hard evidence yet that there's any increase in, say, hurricane frequency, right? Or maybe even intensity. Right. That That's still being researched. But there's other factors going on. Subsidence, which is a massive problem here in South Louisiana and even right. in parts of South Florida. And then, of course, sea level rise, of course. And all of this is coming into fact to complicate the types of damages that you can have. But you've been saying for years that hurricanes are uninsurable. That's kind of like a, a remarkable statement. I, you have to sit back and think like, wait, what do you mean we can't insure a hurricane? What do you mean by that? Well, I think you have to define insurability. So I'm, in, I'm defining insurability as an event that happens frequently enough 
that uh, an actuary who's a, a statistician can go in and say, okay, this is how much our loss curve is going to be. Here's where we're going to put profit. Then we're going to divide that uh, some number there by the number of people that are buying insurance and under some formula. And we know how much we have to charge because we're going to allow in that some kind of fluctuation because it's not going to be a perfectly flat line, but we're going to allow some fluctuation. So fires and traffic accidents and deaths all fit that kind of situation. They don't have big spikes. You know, you don't suddenly have everybody getting in a traffic accident, for example. It, you know, it's a relatively uh, smooth curve. And, and so in my mind, that is insurability. But hurricanes don't work that way because uh, hurricanes, first of all, if you use the historical record, which is a terrible way to do it, but if you use the historical record, you know, they go along and then there's a big gap and then there's, you get three in a row and it's, and, and it's crazy. But even if you don't use the historical record, even if you use the modern way of doing it, which is you use climate models and you embed hurricanes in the climate models and really come up with what you think is an accurate climatology of how uh, frequent a hurricane is likely to be in any one area, any one city, in Miami, New Orleans, or anywhere else, you still have the problem that you have these huge spikes, that you can have one come along that's, that's you know, you can have 10 of them that are all perfectly insurable, they all fit under some curve, but then one can come along and like a great Miami hurricane or a Katrina where you have this engineering failure or uh, who knows what, or a Houston uh, you know, unimaginable petrochemical issue in, in Houston. And, and it's a huge spike in damage that no insurance system could ever finance. So yeah, but then the insurance companies go out of business. And so in order to kind of take that into account, insurance companies have to charge a whole ton of money to, uh, to insure. So my system, what I proposed many, many years ago, to make the insurance system work for hurricanes is that you take those spikes out of the equation because the federal government is going to write a check for 50 or 60 billion dollars anyway. So if you take that 50 or 60 billion dollars ahead of time and put it in a, in a national catastrophe fund and only have private insurance insure up to a certain amount and then the spikes become the, the issue, then uh, you know, are out, out of the equation, then I think insurance prices come down on a day-to-day -day basis and the federal government doesn't end up paying any more money anyway because they were already going to do it when the disaster comes around. So anyway, the, to me, that's why, you know, in the current definition of insurability that hurricanes are not really insurable. And of course, the fight over the National uh, Catastrophe Fund has been bandied about. And the political issues are people in Michigan are like, why am I paying for hurricane disasters on the Gulf Coast? Or Yeah, that's what they're paying anyway. They're paying anyway. That's the thing. They, they, they still write the 50 or 60 billion dollar check, you know, when, when something bad happens. So I'm just saying it's, from it's the government, that's another right. from the government. Yeah, the, the Congress passes a supplemental and for Sandy or Katrina or, you know, anything that comes along the the, the big check is going to be written. Okay, before we go, I want to talk about a couple of your projects. One is Hurricane Intel. What? That sounds so, smart. Well, <laughs> Hurricane Intel. So there, there are two parts to Hurricane Intel, really. So first of all, uh, I write this kind of, I guess it's, I don't know, it's not really a blog anymore, whatever it is. It's a summary, uh, you know, kind of what my thoughts are about what's going on in the tropics every day. And I wanted a place to put that besides Facebook. I also put that uh, now on local10.com in, in Miami, which is the WPLG uh, website. But I wanted a place to put that. But also, uh, I, I, you know, to me, it's frustrating that when an advisory comes out, you don't really... It's, it's a little hard to, to assemble the pieces. Like, I want to know what's the latest on the storm? What are the latest, you know, uh, location, the, the strength and the pressure? But also I want to know what the latest forecast is without having to go on the National Hurricane Center site or somewhere and look there and then look there and look there. So I made these summaries. Um, and then I, uh, that, that, that's an advisory summary, and I put that on Twitter. So if you go to at B Norcross, 
or at B Norcross WPLG, but at B Norcross and and follow my Twitter, it'll pop up for every advisory automatically, and you don't have to go hunt up the information. And then I added to that, embedded in the advisory, there are all this good information. It's all this great information um, uh, that it's just hard to find because it's in a mass of text and you're scrolling around. So. I did one for the public discussion, which also has the, you know, what the forecasts are for storm surge and rainfall and so forth. And then another one for the technical discussion. So anyway, it all comes on Twitter. Uh, you can get it that way. And or you can go on hurricaneintel.com and, and uh, you can see it there. So it's, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's a vanity project, I guess. But uh, I actually use it, you know, to me, it's it um, makes being informed about the latest information easier. I, sus I subscribe, so you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I subscribe to it. And uh, finally, I, I can't go today without acknowledging that the inspiration uh, for my podcast is the Brian Norcross podcast. And, um, you know, I had talked, I thought for several years about doing one and I just I don't know. I just I never could get around to quite doing it. And I knew you had your I went on your podcast. It's been three years ago now. I couldn't believe it. I looked it up yesterday. It was in 2018. But I think you were just doing the audio podcast and you hadn't added this video component, which was just brilliant because you do TV. I do TV. And it's like we should have a visual medium with this as well as a traditional uh, audio version. So I want to acknowledge that and let everyone know that, no, David Bernard was not the uh, originator <laughs> of this idea. Like so many ideas, uh, I got that inspiration from uh, my friend and mentor, Brian. Well, you know, the video podcast, you can thank COVID for that, because the way that that happened was I was doing it at the television station, the podcast in, in the second studio, we had a little podcast studio there with professional microphones and, and so forth. And the people would call in on the phone uh, with, was how we had guests uh, in the audio. But then when COVID came around last year, I thought, uh oh, I gotta figure out something here to do TV and to uh, do podcasts and so forth. And the only way to see one another, because I have a, a like a co-host, you know, the equivalent of Zach, uh, Luke Doris, who's the weekend meteorologist on WPLG. Um, you know, it, it's harder to do if you can't see the person. So if you're in the studio, you can see, you know, I could see Luke and we could have hand signals and so forth. So I thought, OK, let me figure out a way to do it. And then I, I came across this software that we use and and then refined it and uh, made it work. And so here we are. Uh, so anyway, that's that's where the video idea came from. But I like the video. I like it uh, very much to me. It it makes a better makes communications better and it makes the podcast better. I think that's absolutely the truth. And uh, interacting with people uh, makes it, I think, uh, more interesting uh, when you can see them. Well, Brian, it's been great seeing and talking to you. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person again. And uh, I got to see you once. Uh, about yeah, a, month, well, a month ago, you were you blew into New Orleans just briefly. Right, uh, right. Hopefully, uh, the pandemic will maybe begin to settle down again, and uh, we'll be able to make that more frequently. It was really an honor to have you on here today, and uh, I, I think we learned a lot. Thanks for being here. Well, I'm happy to be here. I love New Orleans. I've always loved New Orleans, and I'm so glad that you and Zach are taking care of people in New Orleans. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. Zach, I think you can see why I admire Brian so much and why he's so respected in our industry and in the not just broadcast industry, but in the hurricane industry and in the government and emergency management. Uh, this is a man who has really seen and done it all. And what really inspires me about Brian uh, is that he's not done. He's still thinking. He's still pushing ideas forward on how we can make this hurricane problem better. Exactly. And it's like, you know, forward thinking is such a big thing in this industry, in the broadcasting industry and really any industry out there. But uh, he's got so such a wealth of knowledge and that we could sit here and talk to him for hours just to pick his brain. I mean, he's I mean, he really he, he gave you your that job in, in Miami. He's one of your big mentors. We all need 
to get where we want to be in our careers. We all have those people that help us along the way. Mine was Bob Breck, and now you've been such a, a great asset to my career and making me grow as a meteorologist. So, you know, seeing you and him where it's almost our same dynamic here, it's such a great thing. And, and like he said, Brian, is, he, he's got so much knowledge and um, he, he just keeps going on and getting new ideas and whatnot. And we all sort of share those ideas in the long run. And so remember, precision is the enemy of accuracy. That is one of those that is stuck, and I will never forget that one. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the way you finished the podcast uh, with us was uh, sort of on that note, because you said, what do you see for the rest of the season? He said, I don't know. And, uh, you know, I kind of always say the same thing, because I don't know. And, and yeah. every year, we've got that same risk here in Southeast Louisiana, whether it's a, quote, dead year or not. Uh, that we could have a storm. And he learned that lesson in Andrew. I mean, Andrew, there was, I think, only four or five storms for the entire year in 1992. So, and, and the uh, A name storm at the, you know, the end of August, it's, I mean, that's crazy. Now right, we get the A name storm in May. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's how it's been going. Well, uh, remember, you can also watch a video of this podcast. If you're not watching it now, uh, you can watch it on fox8live.com slash David. If you're listening to it, uh, that's where you can watch it. And of course, uh, the audio versions are all on your favorite podcast app. For Zach Fadella and myself, thanks for listening and watching, and we'll see you here next time. <laughs>